All right, welcome back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It is the Easter period. Specifically, today is Good Friday, which actually is an important day in the Christendom. Specifically, it is the day that uh, Jesus Christ was, uh, you know, who died rather on the cross of Calvary. And uh, what's the essence? What's the importance uh, of um, that particular day to the lives of Christians and, of course, uh, Nigerians uh, generally? We have a pastor who will be joining us now to talk more about that. Let us make a welcome uh, Pastor Femi Ogunso. He is of the Chapel of uh, Transformation, the thing or Transfiguration. Thanks for joining us this morning Thank on you. the breakfast. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's just dive straight into it. Good Friday, Holy Week, Holy Friday. What's the essence of this particular day? Okay, the Good Friday is actually very important for Christians because of what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned against God. And the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so blood, a perfect blood has to be shed to remit for the sin that man committed through Adam. And so Jesus came to die for us so that we that were once the enemy of God can actually become a friend of God. And that's the whole essence of the Good Friday. So basically the blood has to be spilled. And you said something about an important blood. So it's not just about any blood because before now when you talk about making sacrifices yeah. uh, uh, lambs uh, sheep are uh, being slaughtered at, and the blood um, is used uh, for you know the sacrifice so so this particular one is um, a human sacrifice or yeah. specifically how do you explain it okay now what really happened is that the what used to happen in the old testament when the blood of, blood of animal and bulls were being used the bible said they were a shadow of things to come but the real blood that can really atone for the sin of mankind is the blood of Jesus Christ, who happened to be the Son of God. So, so Jesus actually came to this world to die for us. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So God gave his Son to share his blood so that man can be redeemed from sin. All right. Oh, so, so let's talk, you know, progress further and look at the significance of this thing. What yeah. does this really mean? Uh, we know that on this day, a lot of people are going to be mounting the Good Friday. It's a Good yeah. Friday, but uh, narrowing it down to Christianity and those who are uh, followers of Christ, what does this really mean? Okay. Now, as I said before, that the whole essence of the death of Jesus is to reconcile us from being the enemy of God to becoming the friend of God. And the death is as important as the restoration. Why did they reconcile us back to God? We receive life through his resurrection. So both the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are really very important to us as Christians. Coincidentally, you are with the Chapel of Transfiguration yeah. and at this particular time of uh, you know, the Christian calendar they talk about transfiguration of Christ. Can you break that and break it down for us? Okay. Now, the, the, there are a lot of practices in the Orthodox churches that are not really being practiced in the, in the Pentecostal. Like, okay, when you hear about the Palm Sunday, it's very common in the Orthodox setting. But in the Pentecostal, we don't practice it because you don't really see Palm Sunday being written in the, in, in the Bible. It was just when Jesus wanted to enter into Jerusalem and people were shouting Hosanna, uh, and then some people now brought some like a festival out of it and they celebrated before Easter, you understand? But the significance of the month of transfiguration is uh, Jesus uh, appearing on, on the mount with some other um, Moses came along, Elijah was also there, and they were transfigured, and he took three of his disciples there, you understand? And uh, that so shows all the essence of, of grace, the law, and the prophet. Because Jesus represents grace, Elijah, uh, Elijah represents the, the prophet, while Moses represents the law. And so that was the whole essence of what happened on the, on the month of transfiguration. Also, you talked about uh, you know uh, Easter being a, being significant because uh, it makes a man uh, who used to be an enemy of Christ now yeah. to be a friend with God. Yeah. But in all of this right now, it's been years uh, since uh, Jesus uh, died on the cross of Calvary, yeah. and the man has been reconciled to God. Yeah. But why, so why would you say that uh, after all of um, this? Uh, death and his resurrection that we still have a whole lot of uh, wickedness and um, evil going on around the world okay now the let me say something for the world to change the world must embrace christ because the reason why jesus came is to change the world you understand 
But we have to accept Christ as our Lord and our Savior before we can really explain the transformation we are talking about. But the truth is that even in the church, you still see a lot of wickedness in the church today. But these things are not just happening. It's not peculiar to now. If you look at Jude chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible, let me just read it for you quickly. It says that, okay, I say this because some ungodly people have worn their ways into the church, saying that God's marvelous grace allow us to live immoral life. Now, that was over 2,000 years ago. The Bible was talking about wicked people moving into the church, telling people that the grace of God allows us to live immoral life. So this wickedness has always been in the church. You have good people, you have bad people in this church. And it's going to continue like that until Christ comes. You understand? It's not possible for you to have everybody in the church perfect. Because the Bible says that some wicked people will move into the church and they will be telling us that the grace of God allowed them to live immoral life. So okay. it's not new. Uh, well, so one would begin to understand, because there's been a lot of query and question as regards, uh, I'll stay with the church now, Christian, because it's a good Friday. And if, if you move around uh, this vicinity, you see that there are churches almost everywhere as you move. And for those who believe in Jesus Christ and those who believe in the Bible, you will know that Jesus was never really associated with anything evil. I mean, yeah, every time yeah. and everywhere he went, it's recorded that he was doing good. Yeah. And so one would expect that those who are part of Christendom and those who attend church, there should be... Um, the lifestyle, you know, it should trickle down. It's exemplified People, by Christ. It should transform because if you see the, I mean, of course you know, you don't live in space, you live in Nigeria, you live in Lagos and you see the happenings. So you constantly ask yourself, who are the persons committing all of this um, evil, perpetuating this evil and behaving in this act? If we have more churches, should it not translate to having more lives changed? Now, now, Jesus said that if I come, will I still find faith in the world? Meaning that as we are moving toward the end times, uh, you are going to start seeing a lot more of atrocity, even in the body of Christ, than they used to see before. Now, the truth is that we have people that are, genuinely, that are genuine Christian and they are living a good life. But that does not to say that we don't have many people that are in the church that are not living right. So the question is not attending the church. The question is having that experience. A lot of people don't have that experience. Many people claim that they are born again. The Bible says that if any man is in Christ, a new creature, all things are passed away, all things have, have become new. But how many people truly have this experience? Now, the pastor can only preach to you. The pastor cannot force you to live the life that is written in the Bible. And that's the reality we have in our community today. When I got born again 37 years ago, being born again was not in vogue. In fact, people used to laugh at us. They persecute us. Today, no, nobody is persecuting anybody for becoming a Christian. It has become fashionable today to be a born-again Christian. So it's not like it was in the past before. So it's the reality of the environment, this, this, the, the, the situation we find ourselves today. The word of God is still being preached. It's just like the parable of the sower. The Bible says that the sower went out to sow. Some fell on good ground, some on rocky ground, and there some on the way, some among the tongues. The same word affecting the life of somebody positively and not making any impact in the life of another person. So it's not about the church. It's about the people. It's not about the message. It's about the people. Because you have to make up your mind whether you want to do what the word is saying or not. The Bible says we should, be, we should not be the hearers of the word alone, but we should be the doers of the word. No, but some people have argued differently just before Justin comes in. Yeah. Because... Uh, this is our reality. It's a good Friday, and it's important that we look at these things as we uh, exist in this space. Um, for instance, some people have created the, the kind of message that's been put out uh, in the body of Christ, okay. and some people think that this might just also be responsible. The tenets, at the end of the day, if you look at the tenets and what Jesus stood for, it would be the fact that uh, it's just simple. He was about love, and love solves all the problems of the world kindness, patience, what have you, you want to go on with that. So could it be that, you know, the body itself, not necessarily because you have, I mean, for instance, you have talked about the Orthodox. Generations. You have also talked about the Pentecostal. Yeah, yeah. But all of this, would we say that it's still the body of Christ or would we say it's a separate body? No. So, so some people have argued that it is more of the message that's been put out 
that's really the reason for, as, as much as some of the points that you have raised are valid, but this is also another problem why you're having the message of Jesus not being reflected in the world that we live in today. Okay. Now, I'm not actually holding brief for pastors. You understand? Because any... I'm just saying the word, not okay, necessarily okay, pastors, okay. but the word uh, out. Any human system is not perfect. Mm. The truth is that we are pastors that are preaching the truth, and the truth is that we also have pastors that are not preaching the truth. You understand? And as I said, there is no way to enforce any of this. If a pastor is not preaching the truth, how do you enforce it? The system does not permit you to enforce anything. You understand? And so people can, we make a choice where you want to attain and the pastor you want to listen to. The Bible is there for every one of us to check whether what your pastor is saying is right or not. But the problem we have in our society today is that people are not even checking the Bible again. Everybody just listen to your pastor and that become the final. But it's like people are sorry to bottom. It's like people are not really checking the Bible or maybe they are checking the Bible, but mm. the interpretations they've gotten from people they believe, uh, people they have uh, fellowship with, uh, maybe are uh, misconstruing the entire fact because uh, uh, some would... Uh, quote some scriptures and there'll be a different interpretation to it. This pastor might bring one meaning to it. Another pastor would say, I uh, will not bring some Greek, uh, Hebrew connotation. At the end of the day, uh, the congregation, the people you know, of Christ are a bit confused. And that's why I'm talking about the experience. If you really have the experience and you have the, if you are born again, meaning you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, you should be able to interpret the Bible without the help of a pastor. Now, the Bible talks about the Berean Christian. Now, after the apostles have preached to them, they will go cite the scriptures, confirm whether what they have taught is true or not. You understand? And that's the way people should be living now. But the, the stressing thing that society today, people just listen to their pastor. People are too lazy to read their Bible. People are too lazy to confirm what the pastors are saying on the pulpit. And that's why we find ourselves where we are today. All right, good thing you've said all of that. Uh, but let's talk about um, the true essence of Good Friday because uh, there are a whole lot of uh, myths uh, concerning this day. Uh, are there specific do's or don't, uh, you know, on this Good Friday? We have heard uh, that you are not supposed to, uh, you're supposed to just keep uh, a holy attitude, a holy ambience around you because it is a holy week. You're not supposed to eat meat. You're not supposed to eat fish. You're not supposed to eat beef. Specifically, I want you to just, uh, you know, uh, break down some of these myths uh, to us. I think uh, all these myths you have just mentioned, none of them are in the Bible. There is nowhere it's written in the Bible that you should not take meat on Good Friday. And there is, a Good Friday is a day we appreciate that Jesus gave his life for us. But it's not a day to, be, to live holy, holier than the other days. But is there a Good Friday in the Bible? Good Friday specifically? No, there was no word Good Friday. Okay. You understand? But we know that uh, Friday was on the day that Jesus was, was crucified. Okay. And it's called Good Friday because of the essence, the reason why Jesus came to die for mankind. Okay, you're, you're speaking more about the myths. Go ahead with that. Uh, okay, so I, I'm saying that all these myths are not really in the Bible. Yeah. There's nothing like don't take uh, meat, nothing like, I don't know which other one people are particular about. Fish. Don't take fish, all of those are not in the Bible. The most important thing is that for us to know that Jesus came, he died for us, he paid the price for our sin to reconcile us back to God. Two major things Jesus did on the cross, he paid for our sin, he also paid for our sickness. The Bible says, he said the punishment of our well-being is upon him and by his stripe we are healed. And so, if we understand that essence, then we should know that what is needed for us to do in responding to that is to surrender our life to Jesus as our Lord and our Savior because that is how we can take advantage of what Jesus so did. So that's on the what cross. Christians are supposed to do on Good Friday. Uh, maybe to commemorate it, they should remember that uh, it's the day Jesus Christ and they should surrender their lives. What else uh, uh, are Christians are expected to do today? Because uh, if you go about in um, several places, you'll see a lot of um, processions uh, going on uh, to commemorate, to remind Christians of what actually happened on this particular day. So what are Christians supposed to be doing on Good Friday? Today is a day we should spread the good news about what Christ came to do for mankind. This is the time we should be telling the world that Jesus actually came to save them. You understand? So it, it should be a day of evangelism for us, a day to spread the news around, a day that people can make up their mind, accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I think that's the most important thing every believer should do on a day like this. Okay, so 
I totally understand and would say that yes, as much as that's okay to accept Jesus and on this particular day, but well, afterwards, what happens? Because at the end of the day, it's about if Jesus were to be with us today, if Jesus were to live with us today, what would he be like? Uh, so, so what really happens? What's what's the tenet of all of this? Is it okay to just say yes, you're you're accepting Jesus today, and that's it? Then you're expected to behave in a certain way. Yeah. What exactly is this about? No, because I, I mean, this is a very strong one. Christianity is a very strong one, and you have uh, not just us in Nigeria talking about it, or those people who are in Nigeria who have connected to the Christian dom. You have people across the world who believe in this, and so, but we constantly, I will still make reference to the fact that in all of these spaces you have Christians everywhere, but it doesn't really translate if you look at the life of Jesus himself, and you have mentioned. And so, generally, is it about obeying principles or rules or it's supposed to be a lifestyle and what is the lifestyle <coughs> i think it's actually about lifestyle the bible says that if any man be in christ is a new creature so what kind of what what are we expected to see okay now I, i've worked in an institution before before i go in i, I went to full-time banking the question is as uh, as somebody in career do you take bribe what is the quality of life do you live do you take advantage of people in the office what will your colleagues say about you? Christianity is a way of life. And in any environment you find yourself, people must be able to define you, identify you as Christian. You must be a light that shines in the midst of darkness. You understand? So, and I believe that even in your own career, you must have come across some Christians that are unique, that will not take bribe, that will not tell lies, that will not get themselves involved in what wicked things that is going on around. We still have people like that in Nigeria. They may not be many, but we still have people like that. And that's the whole essence of becoming a Christian. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away, and all things have become new. And I still stand on that word that that should be the experience for every Christian. And the fact that we have so many people doing wicked things does not mean that we don't have people that are doing the right thing in our country. Yeah, I need to get um, a clarity on this. Thank God you've talked about um, the Christian, who the Christian uh, actually is. But let's talk about on what basis our Christianity is founded, because there is an argument. I just need uh, to get a bit of um, clarity. Is Christianity uh, founded on Good Friday, or on Easter, or Christmas? Now, Christianity actually, the word Christianity actually uh, came up in Antioch. And the word was, they were called Christians because they, they were living or behaving like Christ. So the word Christianity actually means these people are behaving like Christ, living like Christ. So the word did not come on, on Easter, uh, during Easter or during Pentecost. The word actually came after people have started giving their life to Jesus, and the community started seeing the quality of their lifestyle, and they said these people are Christian because they are like Christ. All right. So basically, they live after uh, yeah. the way of Jesus yeah. Christ did. So um, let's move further, uh, uh, because if I mean, in its real sense, the Bible would say that. Uh, we ought to be the light. I mean, yeah. Christians should be the light. I mean, there are those words like that in the Bible. In the light of the things that are going on uh, in the country, you look at the killings, you look at all sort of things that are happening. Um, what role do Christians really have and how can they bring about positive change? Okay, I think some of these things, the, uh, let me give an instance of the issue of the, uh, the Osinachi, the, the woman that Died recently. Yeah. The gospel singer. Okay. From what we are here, no, okay, she's a Christian mm. or she was a Christian. The husband also attend the same church with, with her. Now, if you look at the Bible, there are, uh, the Bible stated conditions that can lead to separation in marriage. The Bible said in Malachi 2.16 that God ate divorce. But when Jesus was talking, he said a man should not leave his wife except on the case of adultery. Then when Apostle Paul was talking, he said, when you have an unbelieving partner and the unbelieving partner is willing to leave, then the other partner who is a believer is no longer under anybody. So the question is that who is an unbelieving partner? If a man is beating his wife, is he a believer or an unbeliever? If a man is beating the wife, he's automatically an unbeliever. 
Because that attitude, that behavior is not Christ-like. Now, the Bible says if that unbelieving husband is willing to leave, how do you communicate that you don't want this marriage? If you are beating a woman, you are already communicating. It may not be a verbal communication, but you are communicating that I don't want you in this marriage. And so if a woman decides to leave your husband because he's been abused, because abuse shows that you don't want this woman in this marriage. The Bible is clear about all of this. You understand? Some of the things that are happening in our society will not happen if people follow the word of God clearly. You understand? So the Bible is clear. If, because this man is an unbeliever, he has communicated it, not verbally, but by action that he does not want you in this marriage, then the, the woman is not there in a bondage to live. You understand what I'm trying to say? So now, people now are talking about the husband as if, oh, how can a Christian be beating the, the, the wife? But what makes a Christian is your lifestyle. It's not the fact that you attend the church. That you are attending a church is not enough to justify that you are a Christian. I told you the origin, how the world Christianity came about. They saw a group of people not they attending a Christ. particular church, but because of their lifestyle, they said these people are Christians. No, but that's on the one side. Yeah. The, the, on the other side, because Christians don't live outside. I mean, they don't live in a space. Yeah. They live, uh, you know, within the same space as every other person. Yeah. So the question now is, in the light of all of the happenings that's going on, you see the corruption, you see the brutality, you see the killings, you see the lying, you see everything that's going on. Uh, what role do Christians have to play in a positive light in this? I mean, looking at it, what can Christians who live in this space do to bring about positive change? As I've said, that, what would it, our, our role is to just make a difference anywhere we are. I, uh, today I'm a pastor, but in, the, in some years past, I used to work in the bank. And, uh, you know, when you, especially I was, uh, for many years, I was the head of IT of a bank. I was in a position where I could take bribe from people. You understand? But my record is clean. I'm on here, I'm talking, uh, most of my vendors will be looking at me. I don't take bribe from anybody. You understand? So if anywhere we are, we have to shine the light. So doing the right thing in your own little way. The old world may not be seeing you, but in that your little corner, just ensure that you do the right thing. But the problem we have is that we have more people that are doing wickedness than few people that are doing the right thing. And so they seem to overshadow the people that are doing the right thing. And people don't want to even recognize that we see a pocket of people in different institutions that are doing the right thing in this country. We only focus on the people that are doing the bad thing. But what I'm saying is that we see are Christians that are doing the right thing in this country. country. There may not be many, but we see are people that are shining their light in any corner they, they find themselves. They might be shining their light in any corners they find themselves. They might be doing the right thing. But you think uh, Christians are being vocal enough. They're actually uh, being seen and also being heard concerning all of um, the pressure that um, we find ourselves uh, in the society. Well, if Christians maybe spoke a little more or maybe you know, react more concerning all of these issues, I will not be having all of these rights that we have in the country. But you know, what I've also discovered about being focused is that you may have something to say, but you may not have the audience. If you look at our newspapers, what you see there, most of the things you see there are paid for. And I'm telling you the truth. The real news, many of them are being suppressed because nobody is paying for it. No, but I, I, I beg to differ. You know, we live in a time where you have the social media, which has become a very powerful tool. For instance, you can Twitter publish your own news. is a, a, a microblogging platform, uh -huh. just that one tweet. It goes global, it goes viral. I mean, it reaches, it reaches the entire world uh, beyond you know, where you would think that you probably would have traveled to. And so that's the beauty of you know, living in a world where there's development. Of course, this would not be uh, by human power. Knowledge has been given, and that would definitely come from God. And so that's it. So I don't think that Christians would constantly make excuses for all of this. Because if you have, my major concern here is we seem to have a population of people who profess to be Christians or who say we are followers of Christ. But at the end of the day, you look at the society, that crime and criminality is dominant, and then you ask yourself, what is really going on because if you look at the tenets and the teachings of Jesus Christ himself it's really that everywhere he was he was doing good there was never any evil associated with him and even when he was angry it was because you know people turned his father's temple 
to a place of trading. And, and, and that was when he was anger. And some people say that's holy anger. So the question is, why don't we have all of this? <clears throat> so mo mostly, beyond putting the rhetorics and putting the words there, people would say that the lifestyle, like you have mentioned, should be an example. That by your lifestyle, people would say, oh, this set of persons are really different. And what do they stand for? What do they believe? Uh, just beyond you know, the scripture. But looking at it again as we uh, begin to course forward, the 2023 general elections is here. I know that churches and Christians, some person would say, oh no, we cannot be part of politics. And that's because politics is politics. But we cannot, I don't know where we got the division of saying, oh, there's a secular and then there's a Christian because we all buy in the same market. There's no market for Christians and market for secular people. So what should we, what should people, Christians now be doing? The elections are here. We've seen how government policy has affected everyone. What should Christians be doing at this point in time? I think what is important for us as Christians uh, when we talk about the forthcoming election is that every one of us should go out there and vote. But you know, the problem with this country is, uh, you see a lot of politicians, some of them have the right personality, but they don't have the right capacity. Uh, some people have capacity, they don't have good personality. So at times when you look at the politicians that are parading yourself, you don't even know which one you want to cast your foot on. So it's a, it's a serious issue we have in this nation because uh, in the days of uh, uh, Zinadeko, the same people that were fighting against the military government eventually find themselves in power, and yet we don't see have any difference. So it, it, the case is looking hopeless. But the, as a pastor, what I was still telling my congregation is that look at all the contestants, find the one that you feel is suitable for you. Because I can't recommend anybody to, for them to vote for. It has to be their own choice. But we're encouraging people to vote and also to participate in politics. And we hope that one day we will start seeing changes in our country. All right. Uh, we must say a very big thank you to you, Dr. Femi Ogunsoya. Pastor uh, Femi Ogunsoya. Pastor, I was calling you a doctor. Pastor Femi Ogunsoya, for sharing your thoughts concerning Good Friday, what it is, what it is not, and what Christians are supposed to do so they can live and peaceably among some residents uh, in Nigeria. Thank you so much for your time. The pleasure is Thank you so much, Pastor, for coming. Thank you. All right. It is still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll come talk some more. A whole lot to expect on the show this morning. Stay with us.